Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome you to our Wednesday evening uh, word, uh, our our what I would call our midweek message. Um, before I get into this evening's message, which is not, I'm not going to keep you very long. Uh, before I get into this evening's message, I do have a few announcements that I want to give to you as I uh, wait for some of y'all to to check in to log on. Um, announcement number one, this light, because the, the ring in my eye. There we go. Okay, so makes me look like I'm in the dark, though I am not. Okay, so announcement number one is that um, on f good evening, Sister McGarnet. Announcement number one is that in harmony with the South Central Conference administration, um, they have voted to keep our churches closed for the remainder of this year. So that means that we will not be uh, having corporate worship service. We will not be returning to our regular Sabbath corporate worship services for the rest of this year. So it's going to be this online platform uh, to, to finish us out for 2020. And uh, prayerfully, we'll be able to uh, come back together um, in 2021. I was looking at the uh, the news earlier today, actually a few minutes before I jumped on here, and I saw that uh, the CDC is saying that they have a vaccine possibly in the works that could be maybe ready for states in October. I don't know. I don't know how conclusive that is, but uh, I am hoping that um, you know something will change soon so that we can come back together. But in the meantime, we're going to continue to be uh, active and involved in ministry. We're going to continue to preach the gospel. Um, you know, we'll be here Wednesday, Fridays, and Sabbaths um, to 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 lift up the name of Jesus. So um, I know that many of you have been wondering, when are we going to get back to our regular worship services? Um, in terms of our corporate worship, we won't be having that yet. We have we have played with the idea of having at least maybe one. A uh, drive-in service, um, um, one drive-in service a month, uh, where you would pull into the and uh, we'd have an outdoor worship service, like an old-school tent meeting kind of, without the tent, or maybe with the tent. I don't know, but uh, but in the meantime, since we're not able to have a corporate worship service in person, we're going to continue with ministry. And one of the ministry opportunities that we voted on as a board is that we're going to be putting together Thanksgiving baskets, right? So Thanksgiving is coming up in November. There's going to be people already have needs, but during the time of Thanksgiving, uh, those needs are increased and people are going to be looking for food. And we want to assist in handing out some Thanksgiving baskets. So I want to let you know that starting now until November 16th, we are going to be accepting donations for Thanksgiving items. That means stuffing, cans of cranberry sauce, vegetables, green beans, rolls, um, maybe some macaroni noodle, elbow noodles. Um, I mean, people will have to buy their own cheese, but uh, some some potatoes, candied yams, or, 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 um, or see, there's canned yams. There's also, you know, the fresh produce yams, uh, sweet potatoes, you know, uh, sweets, pies, you know, things like that. So we're gonna be collecting donations from now until November 16th. And what that means is you can uh, bring your donations to the church. I want to encourage you to, hey, Sister Brewer uh, and hi, Sister Trauber. I want to encourage you uh, to connect with the uh, Elder Trauber and Sister Angela Trauber to make arrangements to, if you if you got them ready now, I mean, to make arrangements with one of them uh, in order to drop off your donations. Now, for those of you, who are already making arrangements with Sister Trauber to give your tithe and offering uh, to her at the church, um, then you can utilize that time to also bring your uh, donations for these Thanksgiving care packages. Again, we're going to be collecting from now until November 16th. Um, we want to get as many as we can. Our goal is to hand out at least 20 gift Thanksgiving gift baskets, uh, food baskets. So I just want to put that in your stratosphere. Um, on Friday, our mid our uh, Friday Night Live speaker is going to be Dr. Donovan Washington. On Sabbath, yours truly is going to be preaching. And I believe that those are all of the announcements that I have for this evening. 
we are in parts. Last week we had, we took a break from our prophecy uh, series and we are going to be um, picking it back up this evening. And we're going to be talking about, um, we last week we had the testimony of Natasha Thomas, a young lady who, uh, who I met uh, not too long ago and who has a powerful testimony about how God delivered her from some stuff that, oh my goodness, I just realized I don't have our, <laughs> I have a completely different logo on here. Let me get this changed. Boop. There we go. A young lady by the name of Natasha Thomas, who has a tremendous testimony. I hope that you enjoyed her testimony. I was blessed by it. And um, so we, we took a break from our series to hear her testimony, how God brought her from a life of rebellion into a life of obedience. Can I get a amen for that? We, we there's always room for testimonies like those to encourage us of what God is able to do this evening. However, we're going to get into we're going to continue in our series and we're going to be getting into uh, the New Testament, New, uh, New Testament prophet on this evening. Now, before we go there, if you have any prayer requests, please indicate them in the comment section. We definitely want to lift up our country in prayer. This is a political season. Uh, voting is extremely important. So if you're not registered to vote, but you would like to get registered to vote, please let me know. I've already helped one of our members get registered to vote, uh, and I can help you too. I would love to be able to help you be involved of this democratic process. Uh, and what I mean by democratic process, I don't mean that you have to be registered as a Democrat or Republican. I'm just saying that we, in the, the United States is built upon a democracy where they ask us for our opinions, so therefore we... Uh, should give them since we have the right to do that. Whereas other countries don't have that ability. And our forefathers and our foremothers, our ancestors, they laid down their lives to uh, allow for us to be able to have the right to vote as Americans, as black people, and then later as women. So please make sure that you're registered to vote. If you are not, I can definitely assist you with it. It's very easy. It is, it is pain free. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Again, if you have any prayer requests, please make sure that you let me know in the comment section and I would like to pray over your request. So we want to lift up our country. We want to lift up our church members. We want to lift up our, our leadership. We, we, we want to be able to get back into church soon, um, but we want people to be safe. And that's the reason why our church is going to stay closed. Uh, all the South Central Conference churches are going to stay closed till the end of the year. Now, some of you may be wondering, but Pastor Carriker, we see that some of the white Adventist churches are opening. And that is true. But, um, you know, we are, we can only do in the regional work what our administration is telling us to do. And in some places uh, in the work, uh, some people may not have as much uh, st stipulations or stringents or restrictions as others do. So we, being an obedient pastor, um, we are following the directives of our conference. Uh, we can't base it upon what other people are doing. We are trusting the spiritual leadership and guidance of our conference administration. Uh, who has your health in mind? They don't want anybody within our uh, church to get sick. If you guys are going to get COVID nineteen, it's not going to be because it's not going to be because we rushed to open. But remember, we will be coming together to do outdoors. Uh, to uh, we'll bond together, have some good fellowship time together as we do this Thanksgiving uh, food basket. Hello, Sister Winston. Good evening. So let us go ahead and pray and get right into this evening's uh, uh, presentation because I promise you I'm not going to keep you long. Father in heaven, God, we just want to thank you for another opportunity to come, uh, even though we're not together physically, but to come together virtually um, in order to hear from you. God, we want to lift up all of the prayer requests that may be coming through as I'm praying at this moment. Lord, you know what the needs are. You know what the requests are, whether they're spoken and or unspoken. So Lord, we just ask that you would uh, uh, just meet those requests according to your will. Father, we want to thank you for another day of life, health, and strength. Forgive us of our sins. Open our hearts and our minds to receive a word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Johnny Gardner and his family, Barbie family, and Naomi Trice. All right. 
We will keep them lifted up in prayer. I think I have my door closed. Okay, we're good. All right, so let's get into tonight's presentation. Now, before I do, before I go there, what is our thesis text? I know we, we, we stepped away for a week, but I want to ask you, Aloe Bernice, ne uh, Nesblit, Esther Grisby, and Aubrey families, okay. What is our thesis text? What is the text that we've been operating from for the as the basis for why we are even looking at prophecy? Can anybody type in the comment section what our thesis text is? I want to know the book, the chapter, and the verse. The book, the chapter, and the verse. Can somebody indicate in the comment section what our thesis text is? What is the text that we have been operating from um, with regards to prophecy, why it is important. Can somebody type in the comment what our thesis text is? Do, 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 Anyone got it? Does anyone know what our thesis, our thesis text, our anchor text, the text that I've been repeating in every single presentation as the basis for our study? Does anybody? Okay, I see a book. The book, uh, Sister McGarnet is correct. It is Amos. Can anybody give me the chapter and the verse? I see Amos and that is correct. What is the chapter and the verse? the chapter in and the verse. I'll go through the Jeopardy uh, uh, tune one more time. Do, 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 can I get a chapter and a verse? Can I get a chapter and a verse? I don't see anything happening yet. I don't see any comments. I don't see anyone giving me a, a chapter and a verse. We got Amos, but we need a chapter and a verse. Amos, chapter what? Verse what? Give you 10 more seconds. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Oh my goodness, one. I don't see anyone putting it in the comment section. Did y'all forget? I know we have, we have, we've only been gone one week. All right, so I guess I will give you the chapter and the verse. I don't see anyone putting it in the comment section, but Sister McGarnet is correct. It is Amos. And the text is Amos chapter three, verse seven. Amos chapter three, verse seven. The Bible says, surely, oh wait. Oh yeah, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his prophets, to his servants, the prophets. Now, most of the prophets mentioned in the New Testament are reference are making reference to Old Testament prophets. And in Jewish tradition, there are some heavyweights with regards to prophets. So, for example, in the African-American community, our heavyweights are President Obama and his wife, Martin Luther King Jr., Oprah Winfrey, John Lewis, I would say maybe a heavyweight might have been Michael Jackson, maybe, but it depends on whether or not you believe uh, the accusations against him. Once upon a time, it was Bill Cosby. Um, let's see, who else is one of our, our icons? Michael Jordan is one of our icons. Kobe Bryant was one of our icons. Like We have icons in the African commu uh, African-American community. These are our people, but in the Jewish community, their icons are Elijah, Abraham, Daniel, and Moses. These are considered to be the greatest of all greats. Uh, and these men were prophets. Um, in fact, 
what I want to let you know that even though the Jewish community considered these men to be the greatest of greats, Jesus actually makes a declaration as to who among all prophets is actually the greatest of the great. Uh, and it's actually John the Baptist. And, and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, though he is not named by any, you know, he is not named amongst the greatest of prophets. Jesus declares him to actually be the greatest of all of the prophets. And we're about to find out why as we look through John the Baptist's story as an example of a New Testament prophet. Here's his story. His story begins in John chapter one, verse eight through 13, where the Bible says, now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, uh, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense, Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I want you to take notice of what the Bible is saying right here about the ministry of John. Number one, he is called as a prophet. Uh, and 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 uh in the same vein as Elijah and his responsibility is to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's what John's ministry, uh, what his, his prophetic ministry was to be about. Uh, be about. And we're going to explore uh, in, even further what Ellen White has to say about uh Thank you, Brother Trauber, except for your ver your your chapter is wrong. It's it's not four seven, it's three seven. <laughs> but we're about to find out from Ellen White um, what she has to say about the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist. So here we go. And Desire of Ages, chapter 10. Ellen White says, John was to go forth as Jehovah's messenger to bring to men the light of God. He must give a new direction to their thoughts. He must impress them with the holiness of God's requirements and their need of his perfection, uh, uh, his perfect righteousness. Such a messenger must be holy. He must be a temple for the indwelling of the spirit of God. In order to fulfill his mission, he must have a sound physical constitution and mental and spiritual strength. Therefore, it would be necessary for him to control the appetites and passions. He must be a, he must be able so to control all his powers that he could stand among men as unmoved by surrounding circumstances as the rocks and mountains of the wilderness. Excuse me. Now, let me say this. It may seem like uh, John is being called uh, as not only as a prophet, but he's called to be perfect. But we know that the Bible says that there is no one who is righteous, no, not one, that we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So even though John, uh, what we see from what she's saying so far, seems to be isolating himself and he's really disciplining himself, disciplining himself by keeping his mental, his mental abilities clear, uh, keeping his physical shape uh 
He's keep making sure that he's in good physical shape because of the mission that he has to fulfill. And, you know, it would be who, oh, let me not jump ahead of myself because she says more about this. Uh, continuing in chapter 10, she says, in the time of John the Baptist, greed for riches and the love of luxury and display had become widespread. Uh, I know we're under quarantine and I know that, uh, uh, you know, we haven't really been able to uh, go spend on a spending spree like we want to, but there is no denying the fact that the United States of America is definitely a land of riches and a love of luxury and display. She, uh, she says, sensuous pleasures, feasting and drinking were causing physical disease and degeneracy, denumbing the spiritual perceptions and lessening the sensibility to sin. In other words, she's saying that because people, the, the, the culture at the time that uh, John the Baptist came onto the scene, the culture was live for thyself, do for thyself, enjoy life, be merry, be happy. Uh, as, as the Bible says, you know, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the, uh, at the coming towards the end of time. Uh, the reality is there are, it seems to be the several times throughout the history of this world where we have uh, pockets of comfort and complacency, pockets of time where we are wanting to live for ourselves, that we're not wanting to wait for the kingdom that is to come, that we're wanting to have the kingdom and its pleasure right now. But even our definition and our uh, understanding of pleasure is tends to be distorted, especially when we're operating outside of the will of God. So she is saying that this is the environment that John the Baptist is coming into. He's coming into to a, a culture, a world where people are just living it up, where they're living up life. And because they are so drunk off their own thoughts, their own perceptions, off of, off of feelings, off of emotions, off of the do right now, their ability to understand and recognize sin, had, it, was, it was, you know, becoming dull. So they were becoming desensitized to what, the, uh, what the Bible defines and what God considers to be sin. So therefore we have John, she says, John was to stand as a reformer by his ab absten abstenuous life, abstinence, that's what, it's, that's what the word is supposed to be, by his abstenuous, whatever, abstinence life and plain dressed, he was to rebuke the excesses of his time. Hence, the directions given to the parents of John, a lesson of temperance by an angel from the throne of heaven. And I'll just pause right here to say that um, in these last days, uh, while you know we're overwhelmed by so many things and while it is tempting to just kind of zone out for a few moments, the reality is Jesus is coming very, very soon. And if we get caught up, see, the thing is, we don't always know what our hooks are. We don't always know what our uh, those, those bents are, that one thing that'll kind of drag us off into a different direction. And so we, what we really want to do is to try our best to be temperate. And temperate meaning keep ourselves uh, clear, clear mentally, physically, and emotionally, and spiritually. So that way, we can not only be aware of the sins that lie within our own hearts, but so that way we can, we can hear a word from the Lord and be able to clearly point people uh, to him. Ella White continues to say, as a prophet, John was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, he was a representative of those who are to prepare our a people for our Lord's second coming. I hope you're catching what she's saying. She's saying that like John the Baptist was preparing people to receive the, uh, now he wasn't preparing them to receive baby Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist was receiving the people to receive King Jesus. Uh, but we stand as almost like a John the Baptist by preparing people to really receive King Jesus, or maybe I should say that John was preparing them to receive the Messiah, Jesus, and we are preparing people to receive King Jesus at the second coming. So she says the world is given to self-indulgence. Self-indulge Errors and fables abound. Satan's snares for destroying souls are multiplied. All who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. It is the hardest thing in the world 
to be uh to to be self-controlled can i get a witness can somebody type amen in the comment section it is hard to tell yourself no especially when you know that you can and especially if you know that what you want to do is not even sinful it is hard to practice self-control and yet this is what god calls us to do she says the appetites and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind this self-discipline is essential to that mental strength and spiritual insight, which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's word. For this reason, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for Christ's second coming. Amen and amen. She continues to say, it was a lonely region where he found his home, he being John the Baptist, in the midst of barren hills, wild ravens and rocky caves. But it was his choice to forego the enjoyments and luxuries of life for the stern discipline of the wilderness. Here, his surroundings were favorable to habits of simplicity and self to now. Now, everybody is not called to be in the wilderness, right? Everybody can't handle being in the wilderness. But that doesn't mean that we cannot practice self-control. She says, uninterrupted by the clamor of the world, he could here study the lessons of nature, of revelation, and of providence. The words of the angel to Zacharias had been often repeated to John by his God-fearing parents. From childhood, his mission had been kept before him, and he had accepted the holy trust. To him, the solitude of the desert was a welcome escape from society in which suspicion, unbelief, and impurity had become well nigh all pervading. He, he distrusted his power to withstand temptation. Let me just pause right here and repeat that sentence one more time. He, being John the Baptist, distrusted his own power to withstand temptation and shrank from constant contact with sin, lest he should lose the sense of his exceeding sinfulness. Have mercy. Moving on. Ellen White says, dedicated to God as a Nazarite, from his birth, he made the vow his, his own in a lifelong consecration. His dress was that of the ancient prophets, a garment of camel's hair confined by a leather girdle. He ate the locust and wild honey found in the wilderness and drank the pure water from the hills. So what we basically see is that John the Baptist's preparation for his prophetic ministry was really pulling himself away from, from the sur his surroundings so that way he could really keep his mind and his, his faculties so, so that he can be focused. And you know, it's helpful to be focused so that's your way you're not distracted. Ellen White continues to say, but the life of John was not spent in idleness. In other words, John the Baptist was not called to be a monk. Some people have this idea that in order to abstain from sin, uh, to be as perfect and as right as possible, you need to re uh, seclude yourself into a mountain and never be around people, never be around anything else. But as long as you're you kind of locked up in solitude, then you don't have to worry about sin or committing sin. But again, remember, we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity. So isolating yourself does not prevent you from not sinning, because even if you don't behaviorally sin, sin still resides in our hearts, which is where the, the major work has to be done with regards to our sanctification. At the end of the day, sin resides in our hearts. So even if we're not being sinful in terms of actions, we are always sinful here and here in our minds and in our hearts. But she's saying that John did not spend his time, you know, in idleness. So he wasn't, you know, sitting on the mountain being gloomy. He wasn't meditating like some like a, in a uh, a, a another religion. Uh, she says in a set of gloom or in selfish isolation, right? Uh, from time to time, he went forth to mingle with people. She says men, but she he went forth to mingle with men and he was ever an interested observer of what was passing in the world, which means that John was paying attention. He wasn't aloof. And, and may I pause here also to remind us that we also 
have to pay attention to what's happening around us. How can we point people who are living in a real world full of, of realities, full of circumstances and things that are uh, uh, capturing their minds and their attentions if we aren't even paying attention, right? So she says that he was an, an, an interested, so he his head was not in the sand. He was an interested observer of what was passing in the world. From his quiet retreat, he watched the unfolding of events with vision illuminated by the divine spirit. He studied the characters of men that he might understand how to reach their hearts with the message of heaven. Let me say that one more time. He 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 was reading the hearts. Uh, he was observing, studying the characters of people so that he could understand how to reach their hearts with the message of heaven. Now, that was not only John's responsibility, that is also our responsibility. The only way that we're going to know how to reach people is by spending time with them and learning about them, uh, learning about them, them being us. The burden of his mission was upon him in solitude by meditation and prayer. He sought, sought to gird up his soul for the lifelong uh, life work before him. Ellen White continues and says he saw his people deceived self-satisfied and asleep in their sins. You know, I'll pause to say that one of the things that I find interesting uh, during this time of uh, quarantine um, and our church is not being able to gather together for corporate worship is that this absence is really uh, to some extent exposing some of the spiritual conditions of, you know, some of our people. Uh, you know, our corporate gathering is important. It's necessary. The Bible says, forsake not the gathering of, of assembly where two or three to gather are gathered in his name there. The spirit of the God is there. So being together is critical. It is critical. It's necessary. Iron sharpens iron. Our fellowship and our growth together is very, very important. But what should not be happening during this time, especially as ministry, as especially the, uh, uh, you know, the gospel still going forward, what should not be happening at this time is people having... Uh, losing sight of the word, people not being in the words. Um, I just finished preaching on Tuesday. I had the uh, the honor of preaching for a pastor's revival um, in Atlanta, uh, but I did it online. And you know, the reality is that sometimes we're, we do, we're, some of us are discovering during this time that we've been leaning too much on other people. We've either been leaning on um, an elder or a deacon or the pastor or the or the whoever, a someone who is spiritually strong. And, and the reality is God is actually wanting to grow all of us up. So there may be people who have always been spiritually strong and who are growing stronger, but those who have been weak, God is calling you to strengthen up your spiritual muscles as well. The, the word is going to be preached. The word, the preaching and teaching is always going to go out. But we can't be so dependent on the faith of other people that when we lose, that when we have a situation like this where we're, where we're not able to gather together, that all of a sudden we don't lost our faith. Well, then where was your faith in the first place? And so I want to encourage uh, someone we're talking about being asleep in sin. I want to encourage someone who may be watching that you've been leaning too heavily on someone else's faith. God is wanting to call you to get into the word and strengthen your own faith. Because listen, in the last days, if you think we're scattered now, if you think we are separate now, in the last days when we're really going to be scattered even more and, and the law says we won't be able to gather, uh, you're not going to be able to depend on a, a a tweet or a Facebook post or anything else from anybody else is going to be up to you to believe and trust in God's word. And so I want to encourage anyone if if you if you're struggling spiritually, uh, you don't have to know everything perfectly. Um, but I want to encourage you to step up your 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 spiritual game and and you know obviously I'm here to assist with that and I I'm preaching and teaching every Wednesdays and and we have Friday night lives and we have Sabbaths. But um, listen, there are free Bible study plans that you can uh, go through. I'm currently going through another one myself. I go through a few reading plans every year. So that way I don't become dull or complacent or lean on my favorite preachers who I love dearly and who preach thus saith the Lord. But I've got to stay studied up as well. So I just want to wanted to park there to say keep being in the word. Stay in the word because if you think these times are rough. And if you feel a certain kind of way about our separation now, 
it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. And the only thing that we will be able to rely on is thus says the Lord that with Christ, our solid rock, you know, all other ground is seeking sand. All right. That was my soapbox for a moment. The message that God had given him to bear was de was designed to startle them from their lethargy and cause them to tremble because of their great wickedness. Before the seed of the gospel could find lodgment, the soil of the heart must be broken up. I don't know how many of you have done any gardening. I, I know the uh, the system of garden. I know you, you garden. I know the Travers garden. And there may be a few more of you who garden. Let me tell you a true story. I said I was going. I said I was not going to keep you all long, but that is so not the truth. Please forgive me. So when I was associate pastor in Huntsville, Alabama, um, I have always enjoyed trying to garden. I have one of says try because I always go out there with ambition and end up only harvesting only a few things. But one of the things that I did not like about gardening in Alabama is that the soil is hard, and you want to talk about a gospel lesson. Uh, uh, in the house that I lived in in Huntsville, um, I thought I was just going to be able to, you know, grab the tiller, till that thing up, uh, throw down some seeds, water it and forget about it. But I rented a tiller from Home Depot and followed the instructions. Well, actually, I, I, I listened, brought the tiller home, attempted to start that thing and it was not starting. I had to go and ask one of my next door neighbors if they could start it for me. Uh, uh, but when he started the tiller, that thing was bouncing all over the place. And it was bouncing because the area by which I was seeking to till to prepare for my vegetable garden had never been touched, never been touched. There had never, uh, no one had ever attempted to plant a garden there. And so I was breaking new soil. And let me tell you something, that joint was hard. Uh, the tiller was bouncing everywhere. The the, the neighbor told advised me to grab a hose and, and just wet it a little bit. But me being the impatient person that I can be sometimes, I was like, I ain't got all day to be waiting for this soil to, to get soft. I'm gonna drench this thing. Well, that created another mess, a mess of mud. My point is though, uh, I learned just how tough it is um, when, when, the, when the ground has not been prepped, how tough it is to break up soil just to plant seeds. Uh, and this is what Ellen White is talking about, that before the seed of the gospel could find lodgment, and that is through the through when Christ got here uh, or when Christ would have start his public ministry, the soil of the heart must be broken up. And I'm going to tell let me tell you, the uh, the the longer this planet continues to go forward, the harder the the ground is of our hearts and breaking that ground is not an easy thing. It's much, in fact, it's so it's so hard that people find it easier to do missionary trips in other countries because the soil is softer. It's much more, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It's much more, whoosh, there's a word. I think it starts with the letter P. I can't think of it. I can't think of it. Maybe it doesn't start with the letter P. But in other countries, the soil is much softer. And so it's an easy thing to, to run over to Africa or to uh, Mexico or to, I don't know, Asia, somewhere. It seems like it's so much easier to do that. And so we neglect doing ministry and evangelism here because the soil is harder. But let me tell y'all, God is calling us to work this ground. We are, we are called to work Springfield, Tennessee. We are called to work for, uh, to break up the ground right here because there are some people who need to receive the, the, the saving knowledge and awareness of Jesus Christ, right? So she continues to say that before they would seek healing from Jesus, they must be awakened to their danger from the wounds of sin. Uh, she continues by saying, God does not send messengers to flatter the sinner. You know, we like compliments. They kind of help us, you know, they, they kind of soften our hearts. But uh, she is saying here, God does not send messengers to flatter the sinner. He delivers no message of peace to lull the unsanctified into fatal security. He lays heavy burdens upon the conscience of the wrongdoer and pierces the soul with arrows of conviction. The ministering angels present to him the fearful judgments of God to deepen the sense of need and prompt the cry, what must I do to be saved? Some people would call that offensive. Some people would call that too harsh. But as we look at the times that we're living in where, listen, death ain't playing no games with nobody. Um, you know, last week 
I had already prepared my sermon and already put it together. And um, and I had taken and I recorded it at the church on Friday. Um, and if I had known uh, that Chadwick Bozeman was going to pass away later on that day, I probably would have changed my sermon. But my point is that if we thought if we thought that death was a respecter of persons, if we thought you only die when you reach a certain age, the reality is that you know people are being laid to rest. Um, um, whether it was expected or whether it was not expected. And if anything, if we're paying attention, as Ellen White is saying, paying attention to what's happening in the world around us, it should be creating a sensitivity within us to wonder, um, okay, where do I stand? Because if we don't know, we don't know what our final days are going to be. So what should I do in preparation to receive Jesus? I should probably be asking what 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 sins am I holding on to that I need to let go of so that way I can really, really receive him the way that I should. She continues by saying that then the hand then the hand that has humbled in the dust lifts up the pen and the voice that has rebuked sin and put to shame pride and ambition inquires with tenderness, sympathy. What will thou what wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? Ellen White continues by saying, when the ministry of John began, the nation was in a state of excitement and discontent, verging on revolution. Sounds like kind of like where we are right now. At the removal of Archelaus, Judea had been brought directly under the control of Rome. The tyranny and exhortation of the Roman governors uh, and their determined efforts to introduce the heathen symbols and customs kindled revolt which had been quenched in the blood of thousands of the bravest of Israel. All this intensified the national hatred against Rome and increased the longing to be freed from her power. That is pretty much how a lot of African-Americans are feeling right about now. Longing to be freed from social justice, uh, longing to be freed from racism and discrimination. But amid discordance, discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling the stern, yet full of hope. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. With a new strange power, it moved the people. Prophets had foretold the coming of Christ as an event far in the future. But here was an announcement that it was at hand. John's singular appearance carried the minds of his hearers back to the ancient uh, seers. In his manner and dress, he resembled the prophet Elijah. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he denounced the national corruption and rebuked the prevailing sins. His words were plain, uh, pointed, and convincing, she says. Many believed him to be one of the prophets even risen from the dead. The whole stirred, multitudes flocked to the wilderness. She continues by saying, John proclaimed the coming of the Messiah and called people to repentance as a symbol of cleansing from sin. He baptized them in the waters of the Jordan. Thus, by a significant object lesson, he declared that those who claimed to be chosen, uh, to be the chosen people of God, were defiled by sin, and that without purification of the heart that, and life, they could have no part in the Messiah's kingdom. So, what does this all mean? What does this all mean as I conclude? As much as we like to know the future, many times we lose sight of present readiness that we need to receive Jesus just as he is. As a Seventh-day Adventist movement, we specialize in looking towards the future uh, to receive Jesus in the future when he's going to come through the clouds of glory and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those who remain uh, uh, shall be caught up to meet King Jesus in the air and so shall we ever be. As a as a Advent prophetic movement, we specialize on getting ready for the future whenever Christ is going to come. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters of God, that what we can learn from the prophetic ministry, uh, the life of John the Baptist, is that he was preparing people to receive Jesus right then and there. So while it is easy to watch for the times, and we should, we should be paying attention to everything that is happening in our world, from COVID-19 to people just 
dying out of nowhere to pestilence, to disease, to wars and ruins of wars, to uh, uh, politics. At the end of the day, if we become so focused on everything that precedes the second coming of Christ, but we neglect our own conditions, then we will not really and truly be ready to receive Jesus. That is the lesson that we wanna learn from this evening, through listening to the words and, and the ministry that John had. He was called to prepare people to receive Christ right now. And I want to challenge whoever is listening and watching. Don't wait, because uh, the Bible says that, you know, the, the, the disciples ask, when will we know that you're coming? And Christ says, when you see me come through the clouds of glory. By the time we see Jesus come through the clouds of glory, it's too late. So if ever there's a time to be ready, especially for us to prepare our hearts, now is the time for us to prepare our hearts, to be ready to receive him right now, to be obedient to Jesus right now, to be faithful right now, to do the work of ministry and evangelism right now. Right now is the time. We need present readiness because the times are not going to get any better. And, and, and when we're preparing ourselves presently, spiritually, uh, 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 laying aside those things which seek to keep us, to hold us down and keep us back. When we lay those things aside, we will be more tired of being here and more ready to receive Jesus. Can I get a witness? Can I get somebody to type amen in the comment section? As I close tonight, my appeal is this. Don't become exhausted or lethargic in this culture. Don't become exhausted and tired to the point that you check out with what's happening around us. A lot is happening right now and God is speaking to our hearts to prepare us to receive the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he is coming not just soon, but very soon. And you're saying, Pastor, but we've been saying this for a very, very long time. But the reality is Jesus is coming soon. He is coming very, very soon. You know, when I was going through, um, uh, long before the Lord called me into pastoral ministry, I just believed with a, without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus would come in my lifetime. I continue to believe, and I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm a, I'm considered a young person, even though I feel old. <laughs> um, you know, I am crazy enough to believe that Jesus is coming in my lifetime. My parents and my grandparents, they believed that Jesus was coming in their lifetime. P people even before their time believed that Jesus was coming in their lifetime. Brothers and sisters, what I want you to know is that we should live our lives with that level of expectancy. Even if it doesn't happen, we should be living in such a way that we are expecting for Jesus to come. Listen, and for, and, and, and as long as we connected to Christ, uh, uh, our heart should long for his coming so that when we comes, we are, we don't want to be those who, who, who ask for the rocks to fall on us because we can't handle his glory. We want to be those who have been so anxiously waiting on the edge of our seats for Jesus to come that when he comes, we lift our hands in, in excitement and in worship and praise. Uh, cause finally Jesus is here. We, and he gets to usher us to the holy city where none of the stuff that we've had to go through and deal with will ever happen again. Yes, pay attention to what's happening around us. Yes, pay attention to all the signs because they are signs to let us know that something is happening and Jesus is coming soon, but please let us not neglect present readiness. Uh, laying aside, confessing our sins, repenting and turning from the things that God has already convicted us to do. So let's not just be ready. Let's stay ready because soon and very soon we are going to see King Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for him to come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, God, we just want to thank you for the insight on your prophet, John the Baptist. And God, we know that John is not the only 
prophet that you've called, you are good. The, the Bible says in Joel 2, 28, that in the last days, your spirit is going to be poured out on men and, and women, boys and girls, that there are going to be several more prophets. We know that even within our Adventist uh, uh, context, that you gave us Ellen White, who did the very thing that John the Baptist was doing, turning uh, hearts and minds back to studying the scriptures, which, which essentially point us to Jesus. Um, so God, we thank you for his life and his example and his prophetic ministry and call. We thank you for the life and ministry and the call of Ellen White, uh, uh, who, who served her function to point us and direct us to you and prepare us to receive you. God, may we in these last days be those type of people. Yes, we may, we aren't all called to be prophets, uh, but you have called us to be in relationship with you for your word says that you are the vine and we are the branches. And as long as we stay connected to you, it, it is without a shadow of a doubt that we will be fruitful. And that the, the fruit that will come forward will be people who will be ready to receive you. And my goodness, what an honor and a privilege it is to be connected with the creator of the universe to prepare people to receive Jesus. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this privilege to be involved in ministry. Lord, may this the, the life and ministry of John just kind of let that resonate in our minds uh, uh, to, as we think about the work that has to be done before you return. Uh, Lord, keep us faithful in this journey. Keep us faithful in this walk with you. And God, we, we, we praise and we thank you that you called imperfect people to be a part of this work. Uh, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And in Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Uh, I want to let you know that in the month of November, staying in line of, of prophecy that we're going to be having four, I no three um, guest speakers in the month of November um, who specialize in, um, in in preaching prophecy, and they're going to be giving us some powerful prophetic words through the books of Daniel and Revelation. Uh, I will let you know who they are um, after I have we've confirmed the what the dates are. But listen, uh, I want us to be ready. I want us to be ready. There's a there's a word for somebody in these troubling times, and um, that concludes. Our midweek message for uh, today, remember, uh, on Friday at 7 p.m., we will have our Friday Night Life uh, message given to us by Dr. Donovan Washington of South Atlantic Conference. And on Sabbath, yours truly is going to be preaching. Uh, I want you to encourage you to, to stay faithful in your giving of tithe and offering um, as we continue to not only preach, and but, uh, but make budget and do ministry projects, even though we're not able to come together for corporate worship. Um, it looks like you've been blessed by the word and uh, I look forward to seeing you on Friday. So with that being said, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. <laughs>